Hey class, History 211B. Uh, I'm your instructor, uh, Dr. Cheeseborough, and uh, this is your first of several lectures you're going to get this semester. And I would like to talk a bit about uh, material that uh, you're going to be looking at uh, in the month of January and February. Uh, in the month of January and February, we're going to be focusing on the textbook History of Africa, written by Kevin Shillington. Now, this is a general textbook on Africa that goes from uh, prehistory up into uh, the 21st century. And the first part of the book really focuses on the origins of African history. The very first chapter talks about prehistory. We talk about ancient uh, civilizations like Egypt, or we talk about Kush, uh, you eventually talk about the development of cultures in West Africa, East Africa. Uh, now, this class is actually uh, modern African history. You know, it really focuses on history uh, from the uh, period of the scramble from Africa, which you know takes place in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, into the current day. However, I like to take the time, I like, I like to dedicate <coughs> a significant chunk of, of time looking at earlier history because quite often students have not had any kind of background in African history and, and you need to go over it a bit so you have a foundation. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of things just to kind of put things in perspective for you. Now, first of all, as far as we know, Africa is where human beings come from originally. Uh, at a very fundamental level, all human beings are Africans because uh, Homo sapiens, as far as we know, has its origins in Africa. Now, I say as far as we know because, uh, <coughs> you know, a prehistory is pretty much based on two things. Uh, prehistory is based on, excuse me, fossils, fossils and artifacts. And the other thing that is a much more recent technology is DNA. Now, DNA is pretty interesting because uh, with DNA research, uh, scientists have found out a lot of information that you just can't necessarily find, that you can't find from bones or other things. And so that's changing the way that we look at uh, early history or, or prehistory. But as far as I can see so far, there's no evidence that suggests that uh, earliest humans came from anywhere but Africa. So we all ultimately come from Africa. Now, besides that, however, um, uh, you know, in this class that we that you, that you all are taking, you know, we're looking at more recent things, and really, what we're focused on more than anything else is uh, African civilizations, and then also we're looking at how does Africa respond uh, to being colonized, and um, in order to understand that, we really have to look at the process. Now, the thing that you pick up from reading these early chapters is that, as I said before, humans start off in Africa. And also, we see, we see their very, very early civilizations, very early movements towards uh, complex, civil, complex societies and civilizations in Africa. Of course, everybody knows about Egypt. But uh, as you all look in the book, you know, you will all see stories about West Africa and in particular, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, going to be posting films to you about uh, some of the earliest African groups, uh, like the Khoisan people. And also, I'm going to be posting a film, a couple of films dealing with uh, steel production in Africa. And steel production in Africa, in particular, is something that I think is very important. Because this is something that um, people who study Africa didn't realize was the case until not very long ago. I mean, for a long time, it was assumed that uh, the technology that produced iron and later steel uh, came to Africa from uh, what nowadays is Turkey. 
But over the last 50 years or so, evidence has started to accumulate that would indicate that uh, ar that, that iron and eventually steel technology uh, was developed independently by Africans in the, in, in the African interior. And this is very significant because in a lot of ways, uh, civilization does not develop in Africa the way it does in Eurasia. Or, you know, and to a certain degree, it doesn't develop in Africa the way it does in the Americas. <coughs> and there are some basic reasons for this. Uh, now, one of the things about Africa that you should never forget is that Africa is the second biggest continent in the world. Africa has a, a land mass of over 11 million square miles. Now, to put that in perspective, Africa is about three and two-thirds times bigger than the United States. Africa also has a big population. Modern-day Africa has a little bit over a billion people, about a billion hundred million people. And so, you know, Af Africa has, has a very large population, a very diverse continent. Modern-day Africa is about 53, 54 countries. Now, having said all of that, there are some interesting things in Africa. Like, for instance, what we see is that many societies in Africa... Uh, did not develop writing systems. We also see that we don't have a, a great ex exploration tradition coming out of Africa. Now, there are people, like, for instance, there was the uh, black scholar Ivan Van Sertema. Uh, I think he was from uh, Suriname, uh, Guyana, some, somewhere down there in northern South America, who argued that uh, there was evidence that Africans... Uh, visited the Americas. Uh, but I, I would argue that that evidence is not indisputable. Um, I mean, if you look at the map, the distance from Africa to, say, Brazil is not very far. And it would not surprise me if you didn't have the occasional uh, ship that, or, or the occasional boat that made it across the Atlantic. Um, you know, it's not something I'd want to do, uh, you know, it, it's not something I want to do on, on the kind of boats that were being produced over there, but, but that's possible. Uh, but I'm not convinced that we really have evidence of any regular movement of people from Africa to the Americas back and forth. I, I don't, I don't believe the evidence is there. Uh, you know, anything could be, might, might be discovered later, but from what I've seen so far, I don't, I don't think it's there. Now, I think it's important to understand, however, that Africans not traveling outside of Africa is not, it, it shouldn't be taken as a reflection of some kind of inadequacy or, or lack of initiative or lack of intelligence on the part of Africans. A lot of Africa's relationship with the outside world can largely be explained by geography. Uh, African is, Africa is the world's second largest continent, but if you look at Africa's coastline, and I, I really want you all to go on your computers and look at some physical maps of Africa. Africa has an extremely smooth coastline. Uh, Africa does not have much in the way of natural harbors. I mean, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, you know, you have, uh, basically, you know, you have a natural harbor at Walvis Bay in modern-day Namibia. Uh, you have a really nice natural harbor at Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, you have a natural harbor at Maputo in modern-day Mozambique. Uh, Djibouti on the Red Sea. Is, is a good, is a natural seaport. Um, in western Nigeria, you have Lagos, and, and, uh, which, which is kind of a lagoon area, which was a, 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 a place where people could take ships. Uh, you have in eastern Nigeria, you know, the, the Niger River Delta, where people could go. Although, once again, that, that's an area that, you know, both, actually, both Lagos and the Niger Delta, you know, you're really in the heart of the malaria zone. Uh, which, you know, was a pretty rough place for uh, foreigners to go. I mean, that's one reason why when the slave trade picks up, uh, you see uh, 
Europeans building castles in places like Elmina in Ghana or like Gori Island in Senegal. Uh, so, so they would not have to be right on the mainland and be exposed to a lot of mosquitoes because the great majority of Europeans, um, with the exception of people from northern Italy, for instance, have very little natural immunity to malaria. And so therefore it made sense for them to kind of get in and out as quickly as they could. But the point to be made is that uh, this very smooth coastline meant that Africans did not have a lot of incentive to develop uh, a seagoing technology. Because if you look at the parts of the world where people really develop seagoing technology, <clears throat> like, say, um, Southeast Asia, you know, modern day Indonesia, Philippines, the South China Sea, uh, Japan, uh, you know, the area from Japan, you know, from Japan to Korea to China. You know, these were areas where you had a lot of islands and where people could kind of sail along the coast and, you know, maybe hop from island to island. Now, the significance of being able to hop from island to island is that it allowed people to gradually develop naval technology. And the same thing is true um, in the Mediterranean, uh, where, you know, the Mediterranean is an enclosed sea. Uh, the waves aren't as powerful as they are in the open ocean. And you have a lot of small islands. Like, uh, I remember... When I was a graduate student, I remember I flew from uh, Germany uh, to um, Egypt. And I remember flying over the Adriatic Sea and flying over the Mediterranean and, and seeing all the little islands out there. You know, realizing how, quick, how, how fairly close these various islands are, you know, can take you from one place to another. And, you know, that allowed people to develop their sailing technology. Africa did not have that advantage. Much of Africa is directly on open sea. And so therefore, it didn't favor people there developing ships. Now, what we see, however, is that in the interior of Africa, particularly, you know, around Lake Chad, which used to be a lot bigger than it is now, and <clears throat> in East Africa, where you have a number of great lakes, a lot of people did a lot of use water extensively for transportation. Uh, in, the, in the Congo, you know, in the interior of, of modern-day Congo, uh, there was a very strong boat tradition. Uh, the same is true on the, on the River Niger in modern-day Nigeria. And so it wasn't that Africans didn't take advantage of this technology. It was that, uh, you know, the, the, the environment did not favor them moving outside. So therefore, Africa tends to have a history of people coming to Africa as opposed to Africans leaving. Now, having said that, of course, you know, we always have to remember that Africans were the very first explorers because, uh, you know, we have records of, you know, we don't have records, but, you know, we see the evidence that uh, modern Homo sapiens started leaving Africa, you know, in a couple of waves. Um, but we know for sure there was a very big wave around 50,000 years ago. People uh, leaving East Africa, going to Arabia and, uh, you know, going across the southern uh, part of, 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 of uh, Asia. And, you know, eventually people moved into uh, Europe. And so, you know, people did leave Africa. But in more recent times, uh, people came to Africa. I mean, we see this in a number of ways. Like uh, about 4,000 years ago, for instance, a lot of people from the Middle East moved to the Horn of Africa, uh, which is, you know, probably why uh, we see the linguistic connections between modern day Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, with the ling language families that we see in Arabia. And so you do have this kind of movement back and forth. Now, one of the films that I'm going to show you all is a film about steel production. And I want you all to watch that because is very important because it shows how Africans, you know, even though they weren't great travelers, they were able to pick up on local technology and, and, and were able to develop something uh, that people outside of Africa didn't develop until much later. And that's iron technology. And, and eventually, you know, by the time you get uh, about a thousand years ago, we begin to see the development of what become steel technology in northern South Africa. 
And like I said, that's something that you all are going to see in the film. Now, another thing to think about, and this is something that's really important, is the issue of the slave trade in Africa or the issue of slavery in Africa. Now, one of the things that I want you all to think about when you're reading is that slavery in Africa is not unique. I mean, we see slavery in every society of the, in the world. And this is really important because uh, when you get to later periods, you know, quite often people talk about, well, you know, why were blacks selling blacks into slavery? Now, the thing I would say that you really have to bear in mind when people ask this question is that Africans, when they looked at other Africans, did not think about them being black. I mean, being black in most of Africa is not a particularly unique thing. I mean, in comparison, it would be like going to Sweden and saying, oh, you know, I saw somebody and somebody asked you to describe him. Well, you know, he was kind of blonde, had kind of blonde hair, you know, uh, kind of had blue eyes, maybe gray eyes. I mean, you know, that would be a whole lot of folks in Sweden. I mean, you know, everybody in Sweden isn't blonde-haired and blue-eyed, but a whole lot are. I mean, that would be kind of like going to a basketball game and saying, well, have you seen uh, LeBron James? And, 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 you know, say, well, what does it look like? Well, he's tall. You know, dang, everybody in the NBA is tall. I mean, even the short guys are like 6'1 and 6'3. And so, you know, height in and of itself is not much of a distinguishing factor. Now... What we see as we get closer to the period that we're studying is that once you get into the modern period, slavery becomes associated with uh, the African race, with the black race. And basically, people in the West come to see Africa as a market for slaves and Eventually, slavery or a notion of inferiority becomes associated with Africans. Now, Africans themselves didn't necessarily get this feeling. Uh, they basically saw, you know, selling slaves as something that could make them money, something that could get them products that weren't readily available where they were. And so, therefore, uh, the idea of selling slaves was not a particularly big deal. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, you know, you don't really have a strong notion of race in Africa, really, until you get to the colonial era. And that's something that we'll talk about more when we get to that point in time. Now, I want to switch gears and talk about some other stuff. Now, you all will have your first test on the weekend of February the 5th. And so that, uh, that'll, be, that'll be a week from this coming Friday. Now, the way I will do tests in this class is that I will give you a number of essays, uh, probably three, maybe four essays, and I'm going to ask you to answer two of them. Now, the test, it will all be done online. Uh, and the answers, you know, basically, I'm going to, these questions are going to be questions that you can answer probably in fairly short essays, you know. Uh, depending on how you write, I'd say essay is going anywhere from two to four paragraphs. Uh, you know, maybe something that would be anywhere from two to maybe uh, three and a half pages if you, if, you, if you were typing it out. Now, the one thing I'm going to say to you all is that pay attention to every source I give you. Now, I'll probably record at least one other lecture between now and, 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 your, and your first test. And I'm definitely going to post some films that I want you all to watch. Now, by all means, when you're reading those books, when you're looking at films, you want to think about what I'm telling you and how that relates to the material that I'm giving you. You know, I... Anytime I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to you just for the heck of it. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something that you probably need to listen to. Not probably, that you do need to listen to. So, you know, uh, don't give my lectures short shrift. You want to pay attention to them. Now, the other thing, too, is that any videos I assign to you, watch the videos. 
And of course, read all the readings. And when you answer your test, your answers should reflect knowledge of my lectures. They should reflect knowledge of any films I've assigned you. And uh, they should reflect knowledge of readings. You know, if I give you a test, I'm going to give you a test that, that I'm going to give it out on the 5th. And you're not going to have to turn into like the 7th. So that means you got two days to write it. When I'm grading your test, it better not look like you took 10, 15 minutes to write it. If you took 10, 15 minutes to write it, you're going to get 10, 15 minute grade, which you're not going to like. And so take your time. Read stuff. Figure out how you want to write the essay. You don't have to write a long essay, but your essay needs to sound like you know what you're talking about. The essay needs to sound like you got material that you mastered and that you understand how to put it together. You don't want to sound like you just uh, snatched a few facts and kind of threw it together because uh, that's not going to lead to a good grade. So take your time, organize what you want to write and have it reflect the material I gave you. You know, in other words, put a decent effort into your essays. I'm not a hard teacher, but I'm not going to reward foolishness. You know, you're not going to slap something together and I'm going to give you a good grade. But if you take your time and organize things, then I will be very reasonable. Well, anyway, class, that's going to be it for now. Like I say, you all will be getting another lecture from me before the test. And uh, keep an eye out. I'm going to assign you some films to watch, too. Have a good day.